Hello, this is Chris McGrath of TDN, welcoming you to the start of an exciting new project, partnering with Keeneland and the University of Kentucky's Nunn Center for Oral History. We're so lucky that some of the most accomplished figures in our industry have agreed to share some memories of their lives and careers, the great horses and horsemen they've encountered. And we're especially fortunate that the first person to give us his time is Mr. Seth Hancock of Claiborne, perhaps the most iconic bluegrass farm of all. Well, I was born into it and I was around there all my life. I mean, I never really knew anything else. So people come there and they, they tell you that the place is dripping with history and, and it's moving for other folks probably more so than me because it's just, it's always been there. I mean, my grandfather started Claiborne Farm in Kentucky back in 1910 and my father built it into what it was and hopefully still is. And I've just been somebody that's maintained it or tried to maintain it, you know. I, I don't feel that I've had much to do with it other than just keeping it going. I'm not sure if I remember him or if I just remember him because I've heard so many stories about him. But I was six years old when he passed. Of course, Arthur was 12, and he would, he would have memories of him that I wouldn't. But... Uh, I've seen so many pictures and heard so many stories. I feel like I have memories, but I'm not sure if they're real or not. He was a big man. He was about 6'6", six, six, which back then was about probably like being 6'10 or something now. And I uh, guess he had a pretty gruff voice and was, you know, he was a, a real man. And there was a broodmare foreman named Mr. Harold Johnson that used to tell me stories about riding him through the fields and. They'd come up on a foal, and the foal would be laying down, and Mr. Johnson would say, boss, I'll get him up for you. And, and my grandfather would say, no, don't get him up. He's, he's growing, you know. And it just kind of always impressed on me the fact that when sheds started, people were running everything in sheds all the time. And I'm like, I don't know if that's going to work or not. My grandfather said they needed to lay down and rest to grow. So, you know, that's just something that I remember that story about him. Seth's father, Bull, became one of the most influential breeders in the history of the thoroughbred. And the first job I ever had was opening gates for him when he'd ride through the mares and foals in the late afternoon. I got two cents a gate, that was, you know, hell, I could get 10 or 12 gates, maybe hour and a quarter, that's five packages of baseball cards, that's a big deal. And, uh, but it was never, you know, son, look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. I guess when I graduated from college and I went in the Army and I got out in uh, December of 71 and he had a program set up for me, kind of a two-year apprenticeship, and then, of course, September the next year he passed so that kind of went out the window and I, I was into the apprenticeship I'd done stage one which was work with a broodmare foreman for the breeding season of 72 and stage two was uh, go with the yearling manager and break all the yearlings and get everybody weaned and settled and then the third year was going to be riding with the farm manager but uh, I was, we were breaking the yearlings and you know, my father passed, so that that program went out the window. I was ready to learn, and I, I'd hoped that I was learning, and he got, I put him on an airplane over here in July to go to Saratoga, and he went up there, and then he went grouse hunting, and he got sick over there, and he went straight to Nashville, and he was operated on the middle of August, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and he died 14th day of September. And, um, you know, I, it's like, I guess if you, you got somebody in a boat and you throw them overboard, they don't want to die, so they learn how to swim. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I knew all the guys on the farm. Hell, I'd been around there ever since I was a kid, and, I had a good rapport with all of them because I'd worked beside them, many of them for a long time. It's easy to go to them and say, hey, it's, this is what we got to do. We're going to sell the, these horses we're breaking. They're going to New York. We're going to sell them. All the race horses are going to be sold. We're going to sell yearlings next summer. And, 
you know, you just you just go. And one thing about being young, I guess in a lot of ways it's a disadvantage, but in other ways it's an advantage because you don't ever think you're going to fail. You know, I think if you're 40 and you make a decision, you stop and consider what happens if this doesn't work. When you're 23 and you make a decision, there's no thought that it ain't going to work because you just figure, hey, I'm bulletproof. Seth's older brother, Arthur, has meanwhile brought his own immense distinction to the family's story after deciding to establish a farm of his own. In fact, he became the first Hancock to raise a Kentucky Derby winner and has since added another two. Both Arthur and Seth are gratified by the way things have worked out for each other, but Arthur had his troubles as a young man and Seth, witnessing his brother's clashes with the older generation, resolved to keep on the straight and narrow. I saw the mistakes that he made and where it got him. I said, well, I'm not going there. And, uh, you know, when, when Daddy passed, Arthur was running and gunning, and you thought, well, this will be a sobering effect on him, and, he, you know, he'll, he'll realize that you can't, he can't do that anymore. And truth be told, he really didn't realize it by his own admission. And um, well, we were going along, but he had his area of responsibility. I had mine. And I guess we were doing all right, but we also had an advisory committee that we had to run big decisions by, which was fine with me. I mean, I was 23. Hell, I certainly didn't have all the answers, but he was 29, and I guess he figured he did have all the answers, and he didn't want to do it. And he made a couple of decisions that uh, he didn't run by him, and they kind of called him on him, and he, in short order, said, I- I've had enough. I'm done. And he left, and that was that. The farm's young new president made an immediate mark in the record syndication of the champion two-year-old, a horse by the name of Secretariat. The reason he came to the farm was because of a long-standing relationship between my father and Mr. Chinnery, and then when he got sick, between my father and, and Miss Tweedy. Mr. Perry called me when Mr. Chinnery died. And he said, Seth, uh, Chris Chenry died. And I said, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. And he said, you're going to have to come over here for the funeral. And I said, what do you mean? I didn't even know the man, Mr. Perry. And he said, no, you need to come over here because uh, the state is probably going to have to sell some assets to pay for estate taxes. And one of them's liable to be secretariat. Champion two-year-old, he's got a lot of value, and that may be something they're going to do. And I said, well... If you think I need to come over there, that's what I'll do. So I flew over there. He said, now look, you be sure and tell Penny that you're ready, willing, and able to syndicate the horse if, uh, you know, if that's something that they think they might want to do. Well, hell, about a month later, probably six weeks later, she called and said, I'm coming to Lexington with my lawyer, and we want to get together with you and Gail Money and talk about syndicating secretariat. And I said, yeah, that's great. We went to the coach house over there, and we talked about it, and I had a cocktail napkin there and a pen, and I wrote down the details on the cocktail napkin, number of shares, price per share, how many they were keeping, you know, just the structure of the thing. And uh, I mean, but I was being coached up. I had been coached up by Mr. Perry. Arthur and I syndicated uh, bowl reasoning together the fall before, so that was kind of a joint effort. But this was, you know, this was the first one on my own. And there again, I, if I if he had rolled craps and he had had a bad three-year-old year, it probably would have been the end for me. But I never thought that. I just figured, well, heck, he's going to go on and do whatever, and. Uh, but the timing of it with Mr. Chenry's death uh, made that necessary for their estate. And I suppose if I hadn't done it, they'd have gone on to the next person. But, but I had first swing at it. And, you know, back then, there really were only three farms to speak of. I mean, there was Gainesway, there was Spendthrift, and there was Claiborne. Hell, now there's 
God knows how many. I mean, the competition for these stallions now is a war back then. And back then, people were loyal. I mean, Penny gave us the first shot at it because of the great relationship that my father had had with her dad and with her. I had no idea that he could possibly win the Triple Crown. I mean, at that time, it hadn't been won in 25 years, and people were saying it would never be won again. That's just like three or four years ago, and they said, oh, it'll never be won again. I said, I'm gonna tell you what, it will be won again, and it, it'll happen multiple times in the seven or eight year period, because I'd lived through that, Secretariat did it. And then uh, Seattle Slu did it, and then the firm did it all in the 70s. Now we've had one in 15 and one in 18, and we're liable to have another one in 21 or 22. You know, I was just in the right place at the right time. He had already done enough when he won the Belmont. I mean, you know, he set a track record in the Derby, and he, after they retimed it, set a track record at Pimlico. So the cake was pretty well baked, but Lord knows that was some mighty sweet icing on top of it. And to be sitting there watching it, it it's almost like this can't be. I mean, you know, just to keep widening and widening. And you, it was jaw dropping, it truly was. And then you look at the teletimer and see how fast he ran. It's like, whew, I can't believe what I just saw. Secretariat has opened a 22 length lead. He is going to be the triple crown winner. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish 25 lengths in front. In his will, Bull Hancock had specified that the new regime should take a more commercial approach and offer its yearlings at auction. I mean, you might go five or six years and, and lose money every year, and then a 49er comes along, or a pulpit comes along, or a swale comes along. But if you go too long before that one comes along, you might be out of business before he gets there. And uh, he knew selling yearlings was the right thing to do for us to put us on a firm financial foundation. And he, I mean, he wouldn't, he couldn't have known whether we were gonna sink or swim. And uh, selling yearlings would give you more time to learn how to swim. Got lucky right off the bat and Secretariat came in there and, um, you know, and then we were able to kind of keep adding some stains and do okay. And then of course, got Danzig and Mr. Prospector came there in 80 and they carried us for a long, long time. And about the time they were kind of getting old and here comes pulpit, and about the time he was getting old, here comes Warfront, and now he's getting old and hopefully run happy or somebody else is going to pick up the ball and run with it. It's a process. I, I mean, and nobody ever told me, but, you know, when my father passed, I went back and looked at all the mares that he had made it. And we had some big mares like Face the Facts and Moccasin and some of those. And he'd been breeding them to Round Table, who was about 15, two and a half, maybe 15, three, not a big horse. So in my mind at the time, I thought, well, I see what he's doing here. He's trying to balance the athlete. He don't want one too big, so he's not gonna breed Moccasin to a big stallion. And, and so that's what he's trying to do. Well, when we got unbridled, he was a great big horse. And I thought, well, I'll bring him to some small mares. Didn't work, not at all. Claiborne has long achieved unusual international influence. But while Bull Hancock imported several turf stallions from overseas, his son stresses how dirt blood has also invigorated the European gene pool. To me, that, that's a lay down. If you've got a good dirt horse and he's got speed, he, he'll, he'll get offspring that'll run on anything. Now, if you've got a turf horse and he doesn't have any speed, don't, don't think you're gonna get a good dirt horse by him because you're not, uh, in my opinion. And you know, I know turf racing has become a popular thing in this country, but I hope the hell that the people that are gonna try to keep the breed going don't 
forget about good old fashioned dirt because that's where you, that's the proving ground in my opinion. One of the farm's most potent international stallions was Danzig, though his arrival was largely thanks to his trainer, Woody Stevens. If it weren't for Woody Stevens, I went up there and he called me. He was going to run a filly for the farm. He said, uh, got her in. Uh, she's in Thursday. And I said, well, I'll, you know, look forward to seeing how she does. And he said, probably need to come up here. And I said, man, I don't know, Woody. It's a long trip. And he said, no. He said, I've got uh, Della Rose entered for Henrik. They split the race. He's going to be here. You need to come up here and talk to him about Danzig. And I said, all right, I'll do it. So. Henrik and Woody and I met in the trustees' room. Of course, Henrik always had a lot of stories, he, you know, he wanted to tell, and he told his stories, and he said, you know, how great Danzig was, and he <clears throat> was thinking he might stand him in New York, and I said, well, it'd be a tough sell in Kentucky because he never won a stake, you know, he ran three times, and uh, Woody said, said, you you know, you better take this horse. He's the fastest horse I ever trained. And so Henry kept talking. I said, Henry, I can't come close to that kind of money. And Woody looked at me and said, what can you do, Seth? And I said, I probably can sell 40 shares for, I think it was 80,000 a share. And Henry stuck out his hand. He said, you got a deal. And that was that. Greatest trainer that ever lived, in my opinion. He taught me more than anybody. I mean, he, and he took time to teach me. I mean, you know, my father had the racehorses with him when he passed. Of course, we were gonna sell them all, but I was around and whether it was our horse or another horse, Woody said, let me show you this, you know, a tendon or puffy ankle or a buck shin or whatever. And uh, not only was he, somebody that was a mentor to me, he was also a really good friend. And I'd have never made it without him. The horse who slaked Claiborne's thirst for a Kentucky Derby winner acquired his name in picturesque circumstances. They went looking for him while we were breaking yearlings. He was broken right there at the farm and he was turned out in a paddock and they went looking for him one morning. It was foggy and they couldn't find him. They thought he must have jumped the fence or something. So they were, where in the hell does, you know, where's the Seattle Slough Coat? We can't find him. So they said, well, you know, where else he gotta be in there? So they went down in a swale and there he laid down there to sleep. And they'd called and hollered and he said, hell with them, I'm gonna lay here and sleep. And that's the kind of horse he was. Nothing bothered him. You know, he had a tremendous attitude and a tremendous mind and, you know, the hoops and the hollers and all of Derby Day wouldn't have meant anything to him. It was just, hey, let's get, get it on. And he ran a great race. That was tough because, I mean, I'd been up there on Saturday. We ran a filly in the Mother Goose. And I went over to the barn. It was, you know, a nice late spring day in New York. He was standing there, head out over the web and breeze blowing foretop. Looked like the happiest horse on the face of the earth. Came home that night and Woody called the next morning and said, you sitting down? I said, well, yeah, what, what's going on? He said, swell, dropped dead this morning, Seth. And you're like, Damn, you know, what am I doing in this thing here? I mean, this this might be a little rough, but what the hell? I ain't the first one that was dealt a bitter pill and won't be the last. For sure, I haven't been the last, and it's just like you said, it's this game. And Leroy Jolly said it best, this game wasn't meant to be played by people wearing short pants. If you ever see me around these sails wearing short pants, you better run for cover because the world's getting ready to come to an end. <laughs> Woody Stevens was not the only trainer whose old school horsemanship became synonymous with Claiborne. You know Hugo Lassels, good friend of mine, really good horseman. So we were talking about Suge McGee one day, 
And he said, he's really good, isn't he, Seth? I said, you're damn right he is. He's a hell of a trainer. And he said, he's got the gypsy touch. And I didn't know what that meant. I guess it was maybe it was an English expression. Maybe you do know. But, you know, I called Hugo because I've got a, a yearling filly by Run Happy that I'm going to keep and race. And I called Hugo back in the spring. I said, Hugo, this is what you told me many years ago about Suge. Gypsy touch has got to be a good thing, doesn't it? And he said, oh, yeah, it's a real good thing. And I, he didn't say what it is, but and I was talking to Dr. Bramlage one day, and we were talking about Suge. And he said, Seth, what makes him so good? I said, I don't know, Doc. I said, he's... Oh, he just, he said, you know, I'm around there in the barn in the afternoon and he sits in that chair and he walks those horses, go round and round because they get them out for an afternoon stroll at feed time. He said, but he sees things in those horses that other people don't see. And that's, that's, that's just, you know, he knows, hey, I'm not going to breeze this horse a half mile before the race like I did last time. I'm gonna go three-eighths the day before. Or that's the way it used to be. I guess nobody does that anymore. But anyway, it's just a feel, a touch. You know, Mr. O'Brien looking in one's eye and the horse looking back. And I don't know, it, it's just, it's, it's something I think you're born with. I don't think it's something that you can acquire. Like Danzig, Mr. Prospector was a Claiborne giant with an unorthodox background. In fact, he was standing in Florida when one of Swale's owners, Peter Brandt, brought him to Seth's attention. December that year, I said, what do you think about Mr. Prospector? I said, hell, he's doing great. And he said, I've become friends with Mr. Savin and he's getting a lot of pressure regarding this horse and he's an elderly gentleman and he don't like the pressure. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> that's pretty good pressure to have on you. And he said, Seth, he, he's only got six shares left in the horse. And he said, he has told me that if you would give him three million for those six shares, and he can't move him this year, he's got to stay down here, but y'all can breed on that share. And then if you call for a vote in June, they'll vote because there's other folks that would like to see him come to Kentucky they'll vote to move him and it only takes a majority. So I said, well, I'll do it. So we bought the six shares. Ed Cox bought one, Peter bought one, Mr. Phipps bought one, I think Christiana bought one, Cherry Valley bought one. I can't remember who bought the six, but anyway, they called for the vote in June and it was voted 39 to one to move him up here. But it was not my doings, it was all Peter Brandt. He's the one who told me what to do, how to do it, I was could follow those instructions, so that's what we did. Well, any form of athletics that you fool with, speed is a precious commodity, and he had it in abundance, and he threw it into his offspring. And, um, you know, it's just, if you've got speed, you, you, you go in with an edge, in my opinion, and, uh, he, you know, he, he had it, like, and it's what we were talking about earlier, a good stay and on the dirt that, I mean, he'll get you a grass horse, he'll get you one, one run long, he'll get you anything. In Secretariat's case, when you consider the females that he was bred to the first five or six years he went to stud, I mean, it was like a who's who of, of broodmares. And if they had daughters, those daughters had a hell of a chance of being successful a, because they were by him, but B, and probably more important, they were from those great, great, great female families. And then, you know, other, other stallions that are great stallions, they're, they're probably gonna do it all. Like we were saying, they, they'll get a sprinter, they'll get a router, they'll get a turfer, they'll get off track, they'll get fast track, you know. And if, if they're able to do all those things, their, their sons will probably be successful and their daughters will probably be good broodmares. I mean, there's been a many a day I walk down the breeding shed in late May and Flatter might come in or Run Happy might come in. And you know, you would have been there in February, March, early April, they walk in there prancing and they're ready to go and they jump up there and breed and it's great. And it's May, and they walk in there and their heads down. And, uh, you know, 
I, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, well, now, if I was a horse trainer and I knew this horse's personality and he had his head down like that, I wouldn't enter him in a race. So why am I going to breed this horse to 175 mares when he's telling me, hey, I've had 130 this year and that's enough? I mean, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and the one thing about it, I mean, old Flatter's still out there as arthritic he is in his knees, and he's, what, 20 years old, and he's still going strong. We talked about Mr. Prospector and Danzig. They were still breeding mares, and they were 26 and 27. So, you know, if ever I'm lucky enough to get a good one, by God, I want to preserve him for as long as I can, because they are damn hard to come by. As market tastes change, so Claiborne has had to adjust. But there are some principles that abide. Claiborne itself has got about 28 broodmares. They own 30 mares with uh, Miss Dill Snyder. So if you're going to keep those numbers at that level, it's a continuing culling process. So if you know what you're doing when you're culling, you know, hopefully you're keeping the good ones and selling the bad ones, because if you don't, you're going out of business. And if a good horse does come from the Claiborne Dill Snyder partnership or the Claiborne partnership, it's probably been a garden that's been cultivated and weeded and watered and had everything bred to the best stallions you can breed them to. You know, that's that's all the people at Claiborne Farm do. I mean, we're not in the restaurant business. We don't play the stock market. We play the horses and not betting on them, but, you know, betting our reputation on them for sure. And I mean, it's what I, you know, we, we live on the farm. We're, we're there 24 seven. There's no absentee ownership to it. And that's what I always did. And you know, it looks like hopefully what Walker, my son's gonna do. Having made such success of his own tenure, Seth decided that his own son, Walker, should also be given responsibility when still a young man. People, when I made that decision, they said, Seth, you sure you know what you're doing? He's awful young. I said, you know, I don't want to listen to that young crap. I said, he's a year older than I was when I started, plus I will still be, be around, and my father wasn't. And uh, he doesn't rely on me much. He doesn't need to because he knows what he's doing. But I think in the back of his mind, knowing, well, you know, if something happens here, I can always go ask him what I need to do, then I think that's probably comforting. At least I hope it is. Mm -hmm.